Recently, I was given the opportunity to join some of my colleagues and go on a civil rights tour through the Southeast. We began in Nashville, Tennessee and boarded a tour bus for a week. We headed south to Birmingham, Alabama. There we visited the 16th Street Baptist Church, which many of you may have heard of. Unfortunately, it was made famous when members of the KKK one Sunday morning set off a bomb killing four young African-American girls. We then headed south to my hometown of Montgomery, Alabama, spent a few days there, went over east to Tuskegee, Alabama, before heading west through the Mississippi Delta and to Jackson, Mississippi, and then turning up north to Memphis, Tennessee, where we got to visit the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King was assassinated, and then completed this giant circle uh, that began on a Monday, ended it on a Friday back in Nashville, Tennessee. I have many great memories of this trip and many things that challenged me. And of all the great sights that we saw and the historic moments that we remembered, there's one that stands out to me the most, and I've just kept replaying it in my mind over and over. As we headed west from Montgomery to Jackson, Mississippi, we stopped in this little town in West Alabama that is amazing to think about that most people in this room and across America and even the world have heard the name of Selma. Selma is this tiny little town in West Alabama that really brought national attention to uh, voter discrimination in the Southeast uh, among black people. And this tiny town of Selma, Alabama uh, organized marches. And of course, we know of the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge from Selma to Montgomery. And unfortunately, March 7th, 1965, we know we, as Bloody Sunday because as the protesters began their first march, they met the local law enforcement and citizens with, they were met with brute force and tear gas and pushed back before uh, being able to eventually complete this journey from Selma to Montgomery. Really changed the, the landscape of America and, and was a huge vital part of the civil rights movement. I'm not telling you that today to educate us on the civil rights movement. That's a worthy education that I think we all need, but it's not why I'm here today. I tell you that because I want to introduce you to a little church that you may or may not have heard of in Selma, Alabama. It's the Brown Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church or the Brown Chapel AME Church. Brown Chapel is, uh, relatively speaking, a pretty small little church, but at the time of the civil rights movement was this thriving hub of activity. It was where volunteers gathered, people in the community gathered, mostly African-American people, and said, we see the problems, and we know that there might be a better future, not just for us, but for our children, and how could we work together for this future? And so it would host these mass meetings where people would come together, and they would dream, what could a different future for us look like? How could we go about accomplishing this vision? They'd come together, and they would imagine, and they would pray, and then they would go sent out marching and protesting and raising awareness. And and I want to go uh, to, to maybe take a, a leap here and say that the only reason you know the town of Selma, Alabama, and perhaps the only reason the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge was eventually successful in the march to Montgomery, Alabama, leading to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, perhaps the only reason any of this ever happened was this little group of volunteers and people that gathered at the Brown Chapel AME Church. And so we got to stop and we got to sit in the pews at this church and we got to hear uh, one of the church members speak to us. and We got to meet some of the church members and it's still a church in existence today. There's still a group of people who meet there every week, though they are experiencing what majority of churches in America are experiencing, which is a decline in membership. Less and less people are going to church and participating. Now, I'm not here to preach a sermon, so we're not going to talk about church decline, and we're not going to talk about the civil rights movement. Those are both important conversations. I'm engaged in both of those as a pastor. And the latter one, me and my colleagues spend lots of time talking about and worrying about, but I'm, I'm not really going to talk about that today. I want us to take a step back and ask a bigger question. A friend of mine by the name of Todd Dildine has written a series of articles and blog posts that's called our attention to, we are all sitting here, me and my colleagues, asking the question about why our church is in decline. He said it's the equivalent that we're sitting in our basement looking at a leaking pipe trying to figure out why our basement is flooded when the whole neighborhood is underwater. <laughs> we need to take a step back and see that what's happening in these religious organizations is really happening in volunteer organizations all across America. In the year 2000, Dr. Robert Putnam wrote what I think to be a pretty fascinating book called Bowling Alone. In this book, it's a very thick, dense book, and I will spare you the time of reading it and all the research, though if you're into that, go do it. But in this book, tracking from the 60s to the year 2000, he shows how volunteer engagement in American communities has been on the decline. It, we could look at things like politics, for example. 
less and less people get out now and vote. It doesn't matter if they're Republican. It doesn't matter if they're Democrat. Americans in general are just becoming apathetic to the political process. We participate in this less and less than we used to. We've talked about religious organizations of all faiths. All religious organizations in America are experiencing a decline. Maybe on the local level, some are doing better than others, but across the board, there's a decline in membership and participation. We could talk about workplace relationships. There was a time in American history when we were even more connected at work than we are today. We're even isolated in the workplace where we spend majority of our time, unfortunately perhaps, with this group of people in cubicles and office spaces, and we're less connected than we used to be. We could talk about uh, civic organizations, things such as the AARP, the Children's Defense Fund, the National Wildlife Federation even. You could go through and name any organization that you, perhaps you care about or you participate in. These are on the decline and struggling to get members who show up in support. They're run by Washington, D.C. staffers most of the time. And those of you who are often on their roll sheets, myself included on some of these things, we're just typically check writers and not necessarily people who show up at the local level and participate and buy in and work toward change. And so we have this issue of this decline of the American community, really, this decline of volunteerism. Why is this happening? Dr. Putnam has showed us this is happening. Well, he goes on to say, here might be a few reasons why we are experiencing this. One thing is there's a generational gap. We know that the greatest generation, the World War II generation, is just different than the boomer generation that they birthed and raised, and that generation's different than the millennials, and the millennials are different than Generation Z. And by the way, did you note that every generation thinks they were the best and the next one's the worst? Just keep that in mind. <coughs> but these generational differences certainly have something to do with it. Technology has to have something to do with it. We have this idea that we are deeply connected today because we have this device in our pocket that will connect us to thousands of people. Many of them we don't even really know, but we are connected. And we'll sit in our living rooms on a Friday night having the whole world at our fingertips. But all of these connections, I think, are actually pretty shallow. I think they're shadow forms of connection, and they aren't really the kind of connections and community that we need to raise social awareness, to affect social change, or to come together as a community to make a difference for the people who live there, for the thriving of the people. So certainly technology has to have something to do with this. One thing that uh, some small towns may not have experienced yet, but all across the country, we are experiencing the suburban sprawl. I don't remember this, being only 35 years old, but my grandparents only have one left surviving. But they remember a time when you lived here, and where you lived, you also worked, and where you worked, you also played, and that's where you volunteered, and that was where your religious organization was, and your kid played baseball in that town, and everybody knew each other, and it was just kind of a different time. And it doesn't mean we need to go back to that time per se, but we do need to note that something has changed. Now it's not uncommon that you live here, you drive 45 minutes to work, then you drive 20 minutes to where you go to church, and then 30 minutes to your favorite restaurant, and your kids don't play city ball anymore, they play travel ball. We play all over the state now because we think we're raising future athletes. Most of them won't make it. <laughs> and so we're spread out, and we are running ragged. There is no uh, denying that the American family, whether or not we are busier than we've ever been, we certainly feel like we are busier than we've ever been. We run all over the place, and when we do have a little margin in our lives, we're just too tired and exhausted to do anything meaningful with it. Add to that, I think we live in this hyper-individualistic culture. I think it's okay to, be, to have a sense of individualism. That's a good thing, but this hyper-individualism that's all about me, and, and you see it all around you. There was a time when you recruited to the military by quoting the current president that said, ask not what your country could do for you, but what you could do for the country. It's not about you as the individual. It's about your participation in the greater good of the group. Well, I grew up in the 90s, and our invitation was, come and be all that you can be. Join an army of one. And we could add our phones, our technology, all these things that have made us hyper-individualistic where we just, we're more isolated, we think more about ourselves, and we forget about the community at large. So we have this problem. Volunteerism is on the decline. Communities, in, in a sense, are on the decline. And we could point to several reasons why. I could go on and on here with various reasons, and we could all participate back and forth in what we think is causing this. But my guess is that you all have felt a little bit of this as well. You have seen a little bit of this as well. And you may ask the question, well, so what? 
So what if our communities are on a decline? What if people are volunteering a little bit less? What if we stay home more on Friday night and connect with each other through Facebook and Twitter rather than having real conversations? So what if religious, religious organizations die? Some people want that to happen. They think it would be good for the world. Why does any of this matter? Well, Dr. Putnam would go on to say, it turns out it may have more harmful effects than we realize. Because did you know being socially connected to one another, being engaged in a community has a direct correlation to the lives of the people there, whether or not they will be more healthy, wealthy, and wise. We have talked a lot about education, and education is a huge topic in America and in our communities and in our cities. And if we're going to have a bright future for our children, well, we better have a good school system and better education. Did you know that children, the more socially connected they are to one another, students, the more connected they are and have this sense of connection to other people, is a direct correlation to their success as students. And not just elementary or high school age, but even college students, the more involved in extracurriculars, the more friends they have, the more of this social connection that Dr. Putnam calls social capital, the more likely they are to stay in school and to succeed and do well. So we could talk about education and how it affects that. Even the safety of our neighborhoods. It's a proven fact through statistics and research that the more you know your neighbors and the more connected you are in your neighborhood, the more safe your neighborhood will be. Even an economy that works for most people or all the people and has greater job opportunities and the potential of earnings, the better job opportunities you have the more is directly correlated to the more socially connected you are. Think about how many people have a job and you go, are they even qualified for that? How'd they get that job? Social connections, it's all about who we know. Your resume only can take you so far. So even the ability to earn an income, perhaps this may be more harmful than we realize. This isolation, this moving at this rapid pace, this disconnectedness, this lack of volunteerism, maybe it could actually be dangerous for us in our futures and the future of our children. Maybe it has more harmful effects than we have ever thought about or noted. We like to think what I was taught growing up and I deeply appreciate this. I was taught you pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. You work hard. You can blame no one in the world but yourself. And I believe a good sense of that. I teach my children that. I want them to have that great work ethic. But do you know that there just comes a point in time where we just need each other? We need the connections of one another. We need to help one another. You can only carry yourself so far. And so we need each other. And so here we sit today in Midland, Texas. A unique community, no doubt. I lived here for a short time in my life, still have friends here, still uh, hear a lot about it, have learned much of the history here, and it's a unique place. I get the sense of that for many reasons. Well, one of the great reasons is the liquid gold that's underground here that produces this economy that has this great potential. And Midland is unique, but it's not unlike most communities in America, I believe that have these great needs in front of us, these great challenges in front of us, or I would like to call them these great opportunities in front of us. When it comes to things like education, or healthcare, or housing, or infrastructure, or quality of place, all these things we could put in front of us that are these great challenges that all communities in America are facing, yet we're also faced with this reality that there are less and less people engaged and bought in and doing this hard work that's needed. But what if, in the 1960s in Selma, Alabama, there wasn't a Brown Chapel AME church. What if there wasn't this hub of volunteerism, these people coming together, working for the greater good of their community, trying to think about how could we make a difference for our children and for ourselves and for our future? What if this church never existed? You may not even know the name Selma, Alabama. I may not even know it growing up 60 miles from it. It's just another small town in West Alabama, but it turns out that it changed the face of America. It has world recognition because of this little group of people who came together and were bought into changing their lives and the lives of their children and the lives of their community. And what happens in our country? What happens in these small communities all across America? What happens in Midland, Texas, when there are no more people who show up to the Lions Club's meetings? When there are no more people who will be members of the Chamber of Commerce, when you host a young professional organization meeting and no one is there to participate, they'll write checks 
to it. They'll give money to it, but they won't give their time and their service. What happens when no one participates in the political process and gets out and votes? What happens when we have all these needs, but we're content just to sit at home behind our devices, hiding from one another and not engaging in what is needed to change the face of our communities and our world? What happens when we're not coming together to work for the flourishing of people? You see, I think the challenges are great. I think the opportunities are greater but I think that the laborers are few. Well, my favorite thing to do when I discover a problem is the mature thing to do, and that's find a scapegoat and blame someone else, right? <laughs> it's not my problem. It's the millennials. And now the millennials say it's Generation Z. We could just keep pointing out it's not me, it's them. But the reality is we can't blame others. This problem falls squarely on my shoulders and your shoulders sitting here today. We are going to have to be bought in, working together for the good of our communities. And so I leave you with this challenge today. I leave you with this call, if you will. Buy in to your city and your local community. Be proud of where you live and where you work and where you play. Be proud of your city and your community and get out and get involved in these organizations. We need these organizations and they need your money. Keep giving them money. Trust me, nonprofits need money. It's good. But we need you too, your bodies, your minds, your engagement, your vision, your dreaming along with us. Instead of going on social media and creating more division that we experience in our world and slinging social mud at your neighbors, go meet your neighbors. Invite the people in your community to sit down for a cup of coffee. Intentionally get those who disagree with each other and let's come to the table and dream together for our community. How could we create a society that works for the good of the people here? Let's get together. Let's get to know each other. Let's meet our neighbors. Let's jump in. Let's be present. Let's get involved. You baby boomers who've created some of these great organizations that are flooded with these strange alien millennial people. <laughs> Rather than just earning a living here and bouncing out of town to spend it elsewhere and just hoping for the best for the future, bring your wisdom to the table. Millennials, bring your energy to the table and sit down and say, how could we create a great organization that's for the good of this community and the flourishing of the people who lived here. What would happen if we as a people said, we're gonna slow down. We're gonna get off our devices from time to time. We're gonna get out of travel ball because the truth is little Mikey's not that good. <laughs> we're gonna be engaged in our community a bit more. We'll still go to Vegas and still go to the beach, but we're gonna spend more weekends bought into the local community where we live, meeting our neighbors and working for the good of the people. What might happen in a community like Midland, Texas, and communities all across this nation, if people said, we're gonna stop this decline, we're gonna get bought in, we're gonna jump in to our cities, what could happen, what could we see? Because I think the world needs the Brown Chapels. I think the world needs these volunteer organizations, but volunteer organizations need this key thing, volunteers, which means you and me bought in. So let's fight this tidal wave of the declining American community and volunteerism, and let's jump into our cities with both feet. Thank you.